Have you ever had a question and then wanted the answer? That's today's program. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Burns and thank you for joining me on Walking with the Word, a program simply designed for you and for me to take the Bible and, and open it up and learn more so that we may grow inside of the Word. We have an interesting question that comes before us and it's phrased in what I think to be a great way. What is the best way to reach others with the gospel. You see, the Bible is a very interesting thing. It, it's, a, it's a book of history. Now, the Old Testament details all the information in the coming of the Christ. We have that information really starting in Genesis 3.15, where that great depiction of the devil and the Messiah, the Savior, he's going to destroy the devil, and the devil will not destroy Jesus. And from that point forward, we have this historical document, but also this teaching document that teaches us about God, that teaches us about our response to God. And Romans 15, 4 says this, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. The Old Testament is about the hope of Jesus who is coming. The New Testament especially as we think about the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are about Jesus who comes, His ministry, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. The book of Acts illustrates Jesus who ascends, the apostles who have everything Jesus told them they were going to have, and the great establishment of the church. And then from that point forward, we have the church and the things that happen with the church because here's a true statement, people aren't perfect. And sometimes people mess things up, even things... They should get right. And from that point forward, we have the church who grows and flourishes and thrives. And what we see in the New Testament is people who reach out to others to help bring them to Christ. So what is the best way in the day and age we live to do that? I have four words for you. Move, learn, listen, come. Now these words will help us illustrate what we need to do to reach others in this life. Let's start by talking about moving forward. And I want you to think about the time when the disciples of Jesus, well, they've heard from a resurrected Savior. It's in this occasion we read about the disciples. And we read about the things that Jesus did to them and said to them. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus has told the disciples, it's time to move forward. He tells them in this particular scene and gives us some information as we read about this particular scene about their condition. The eleven were there and he has sent them away. He's told them to go into his particular mountain and when he gets there, some doubted. I want you to think about the disciples for just a minute and, and what it must have been like to be with Jesus, to walk with Him as you're just going from place to place, to ask Him for advice, to see Him interact with people who loved Him, but also people who hated Him, to see Him as He pressed forward in situations that we can't comprehend. That was the disciples' relationship with Jesus. They saw him in every scenario, every opportunity, and he flourished. And we read in the text, and some doubted. But then we see this. He says to them, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus tells his disciples, there's no reason to doubt. But then he uses this word, and it's a real interesting word, and then gives them three important commands. Number one, he says, go. 
There's the move forward. We will never help others to come to Christ if we won't go. If we won't go out about in our days. If we won't go out about in our world. If we won't go out about in our communities, in our families, in our places of which we dwell. He says, go. We are not designed. Christians are not designed and people in general are not designed to just sit still, to do nothing. However, boy, isn't that the great temptation, to be lazy. Jesus says, go. And then three things he says. He says, number one, make disciples, the New King James Version tells me. The King James Version says, teach. If I'm going to make disciples, I am going to have to teach some kind of message. Now that's where we have to ask the question of what we're going to do. Am I going to teach my message or am I going to teach the message of Christ? Which one will bring about Christians? The message of Jonathan and have Jonathanites? Or the message of Christ and have Christians, Christ-like people. Number one, he says, make disciples. He says, teach. Number two, he says, baptize. Why is baptism important? Because Jesus said so. When we teach folks about the gospel, we're trying to get them to obey the gospel. How do we obey the gospel? We are buried with him in baptism. Then number three, he says, teach. Make disciples, teach. Baptize and keep teaching. This one is the one we fail at. It's the one we struggle with. It's the one we don't often get right. But we can move forward. We can go. We can teach. We can baptize. We can teach. How do you become the best at teaching others the gospel? Well, follow the New Testament pattern. Wherever you go, find a way to make Christ the center of your life and tell someone else about Him. Number two, we need to learn lessons. Now, we learn all throughout our lives in in various ways, but there are some lessons we need to learn. One of them comes in Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus The multitudes were there. The disciples come and he teaches. It's almost as if he waits for the disciples because there was something they needed to learn. But wait a minute, they're the disciples. You'll remember that Jesus called them with varying language. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He's going to teach them. And Jesus in this particular occasion in Matthew chapter 5, as he's opening up what we would call the Beatitudes and continuing in a rather lengthy segment, Jesus is teaching the disciples. I ask you this question. Did they learn the lesson? But maybe in a more important factor to you and I, do we learn the lesson? Go back and read from Matthew chapter 5, 1 and 2 to the time when Jesus finishes his discourse and ask yourself the question, what was the lesson? Because we need to learn the lesson. Not only that, we need to listen, but we need to listen clearly. You ever heard somebody say something, but you didn't quite understand what they said? Sometimes I'll be teaching a class and I I like to have a lot of participation in my classes. I like when people talk up. I like when people ask questions. I like when people respond to things that are being said because a class should be something that we participate in together because we're trying to learn together. And I believe we learn the best when we're together. But sometimes when I'm teaching, I'm so focused on what I'm thinking and and, and how to control my PowerPoint, and and where I'm supposed to be, and and what I'm actually saying, and where I want to go next, that someone will say something, and I will say, listen, I heard you, but I didn't hear you. In other words, I wasn't clearly listening, because so much was going on, and I'll have them re-say it so that I can hear them. Listen to the words of Luke 10, 
30. Then Jesus answered, after a man asked some questions, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now listen, just, just hear what Jesus says. He gives an illustration before us. Matter of fact, you're going to have to go read this part of Luke 10 to get it all. But Jesus gives an illustration. A certain man goes down to Jerusalem from Jericho and he falls among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, leaving him for dead. Now it just so happens in the next verse, verse 31, a priest comes by the way. And the text indicates that he looked down at him, he, he gazes at him, and he passes by on the other side. In verse 32, the next verse, a Levite comes. Same thing, he gazes upon him, he sees his condition, and he passes by on the other side. Now Jesus is getting ready to ask the question, who helped this man? That's the essence of the question. Who did what was right it's not going to be the priest and it's not going to be the Levite. The two people who should have known better. A priest and a Levite. People of the law. A Samaritan comes, verse 33, the next verse. So from verse to verse to verse, down to verse 33. A Samaritan comes and he helps him. He binds up his wounds. He puts him on his own. He carries him to to a place which could help him. He pays the way to help him. And he says, if there's any more, I will come and I will repay you all. Let me ask you this. The priest who came by the way, did he listen? He didn't. The Levite who came by the way, did he listen? The Samaritan who came by the way, did he listen? And now we're beginning to see what we need to know. We see people all the time in life and we need to be people who listen clearly. Here's the final one. We need to come boldly. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we ourselves have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We serve the suffering, sinless Savior. Here he's illustrated in Hebrews 4 as the high priest the one that can forgive all. He was tempted in every way that we are. And I want you to listen to this. I want you to hear how he was tempted, yet without, listen to this next word, sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God of God. Sin. Sin's our problem. The Savior is the answer to sin. Now you've got to be a part of that answer too. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But in this he says as we're thinking about the passage that we, we need to come boldly to the throne of His grace. We need to run to the Savior. Why? Because He can give mercy. He can give grace when we need it the most. We need to have confidence, boldness to know that Jesus is the one we need. So we move. We move. That's where we started today. We learn. We listen. And we come. All in this idea of what is the best way to help bring someone to the gospel. What we have to do is we have to be willing ourselves to be a participant, to be a follower, to be a disciple, to be someone who walks with the Word every day of our lives.